Well, all praise be to God. What an amazing praise and worship session. I believe that God was duly lifted, rightly lifted. Thank you so much, Zion. Thank you so much for serving us so well. Welcome to everyone who has tuned in to the Citadel, the online church. It is Sunday, November 1st, and this is not a pre-recorded message. I'm right here in my saddle to serve you. I want you to know that God is still on the throne and he's working it out for you and I. I am, as you all may know, uh, fresh in from the events happening in Alamance County on yesterday that have thrust our organization, Justice for the Next Generation, into the national spotlight once again. However, I wanted to make sure that I was faithful to the congregation that I serve, and I tell you, I am grateful to God for the purpose of my life to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. I have a word from the Lord. The Lord uh, does this so eloquently, um, changes everything at times that we had planned in order to pull us into our purpose. We can't always see where we're going. And I did not plan to be here like this today. I didn't plan to show up tired, uh, exhausted, burdened, burning from tear gas. It was never my intention and never my, uh, never my desire um, to even preach what I'm about to share with you. But as the Lord would have it, all things work together for the good of them that love God and are called according to his purpose. Go with me to Isaiah chapter 10. Isaiah chapter 10, there's a word from the prophetic text. And we're going to start right here on top at the very first verse. Woe unto them who decree unrighteousness, decrees, and who write grievousness, which they have prescribed. Turn aside the needy from judgment and to take the right from the poor away, the poor of my people, that widows may be their prey and that they may rob the fatherless. And what will you do in the day of visitation and in the desolation which come from far? To whom will you flee for help? And where will you leave your glory? Without me, without me, they shall bow down under their prisoners. And they shall fall under the slain. For all his anger is not turned away. But his hand, God's hand, is stretched out still. God's hand is stretched out still. Our Father and our God, I bless you and I love you today. God, I thank you for everything that you are doing in the midst of us. And I ask you, Holy Spirit, to speak a word to our situation that will change the direction of our nation. God, give us strength in your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord, everybody. I want to talk to you just a few moments from this thought. Change is within our reach. Change is within our reach. Let me share with you that oppression is Christian. 
Oppression is Christian. Throughout the history of this Christianity faith, stretching back even way before our time into the ancient scrolls as we find here in the text of the prophet of Isaiah, we find that even the earliest believers were facing oppression at the hand of hypocrisy and sacrilegious leadership. This injustice that we are experiencing even now has been going on long before it became a matter of black and white. To lift this text from a different translation, I want you to hear it expressed in these words. Woe unto those who decree iniquitous decrees and the writers who keep writing oppression to turn aside the needy from justice and to rob the poor of my people of their right, that widows may be their spoil and that they may make the fatherless their prey. What will you do on the day of punishment in the ruin that will come from afar? To whom will you flee for help and where will you leave your wealth? Nothing remains but to crouch among the prisoners or fall among the slain. For all this anger has not turned away. And his hand, God's hand, is stretched out still. To say oppression is Christian is very provocative. I'm reading from an Old Testament, an ancient text, a pre Jesus text. But our faith has been formed around this word, Christianity. Those who believed in God then identify with those, those who believe in God now. And even though this text comes from an occasion in the history of those who were in the way at that time, which predates the coming of Jesus Christ and the covenant that Jesus Christ would establish with us, I would have you to know that just as then religious believers and as they do now, religious believers are guilty of oppression. Guilty of oppression. Oppression that has followed our faith down through the eons of time, but not godly so. It would be an injustice to our faith foundation for God not to have inspired people in this word to write the truths about the history of those who have followed in what they believed was the way. It would be it would be unintegral of God then, even as it would be unintegral, unintegral of the church now, to act as if our church history has always landed on the right side of righteousness. What we find in our text right here is God is pushing back against those who have through hypocrisy, claimed they were doing God's work. Kings who claimed to be ruling under God's influence, who actually were writing oppressive laws and legalities to marginalize God's people. <laughs> Does it sound familiar? We are living in an America today and under a current administration today of leadership that claims to be evangelical, that claims 
to be those who are sent by God, whose actions, whose laws, whose policies, and whose procedures are ordained by God. However, people, people not just black, people not just brown, poor people of every color, of every creed, of every gender and every orientation, in addition to the African-American and the Hispanic communities and the other nationalities that lie in between the spectrum of melanin, have suffered under the oppressive rule and the oppressive reign of a supremacy that claims God. When I say Christian, when I say oppression is Christian, I don't mean that Christ is. I mean that our Christianity has been. We have used our faith to sideline people who did not see as we see and do as we say. We have used our faith to condemn people, even though the word of God says, now therefore there is now no condemnation to those who love the Lord and are called according to God's purpose. We have used our pulpits as bully pulpits to bring people into a faith that hasn't always been on the right side of Christ's identity. I don't want you to mistake this fact. There is nothing oppressive about Christ. But there has been so much that has been oppressive about Christianity. Perhaps this is why we heard in God's word, woe be unto them who scatter my sheep. Woe be unto them who scatter my sheep. If those scriptures were not so, they would not have been inspired. When we hear God speak of this oppression and we hear those words, we understand that God is admitting to a fraudulence that will exist in our faith. God is admitting to the fact that even though I am God and I can do as I please, I'm sovereign, I will never infringe upon the rights of the will of man. And that is one of the reasons why we should fight for equality for all. Matters not where we land on the spectrum of all. All is all. Matters not if we agree. Matters not if people choose sin. God let them. Matters not if people choose salvation. God graced them. But because God gave us our own rights, our will, we'd have to understand that it would be a self-serving God to make us obey God. And that's why the Lord said many times over, choose ye this day whom ye will serve. I would rather that you would be hot or cold than for you to be lukewarm. I would rather for you not to choose me than to say you do and don't serve me. I would have more respect. I believe that God can work with those who are not all the way in if they could just confess it. In doing this work of justice, I have seen God's righteousness upon people that the church would say are hellbound. I have seen the love of God be demonstrated in people who did not, who don't do as we do as Christians who don't claim the name of Jesus and and lift the name of Jesus in conversations where Jesus should never even be invoked. I want you to understand that the change that we need right now in this land should start in our hearts. Just ahead of a 2020 election, this change that I'm discussing is not political. 
This change that I'm discussing is more powerful than politics. This change that I am discussing is more powerful than a politician's platform. This change is about God's purpose in the earth. <coughs> This change is a change that the prophet Isaiah believed God for because God said it was so. This change is a change that is possible to all those who believe that God's hand is stretched out unto those who have been oppressed. I want you to see with me in this text a little bit more in this chapter, this 10th chapter of Isaiah, God gives a warning against proud oppressors, against people who have not just worked to oppress those others, but people who have done so in such a way that they're proud of it. Woe unto them who decree unrighteous decrees, who write grievousness which they have prescribed. Allow me to share with you that this very first verse is quite revealing. This very first verse is revealing of the use of law to marginalize God's people. The use of legality to oppress has predated our civil rights movement. The, root, the use of legality to oppress predated Jim Crow South. Predated an American Civil War, predated the Union and Confederates, predated even the chattel, chattel slave trade of the early 16 and 1700s. This use of laws, decrees, and legality followed us into this millennium. This has been something that God has always pushed back on. Woe be unto them who write unrighteous decrees. I'm using the King James version of this text. Even that version speaks clearly to us. Who write grievousness which they have prescribed. Do you all recall perhaps that voter suppression was once legal? Do you recall, perhaps, that the Holocaust was once legal? Do you recall in a 2020 society that women's voting rights, or shall I say disenfranchisement, women's suffrage was once legal as we celebrate the 100th anniversary of women's voting rights and the women's suffrage history. Do you recall that our ability as people of color, particularly African Americans, that our ability to learn, to read, and to write this was not always a legal right. It was once legal for a person such as myself, and perhaps many of you all who are watching me right now, to be turned away from the schoolhouse and the ballot box. You'd have to understand that slavery was once legal. <laughs> you'd have to understand that 
for so long, laws have been lifted up to oppress people. And our text has set the precedence of this practice. Woe against proud, woes the word preaches against proud oppressors. Do you not understand that there are people that refuse to disavow that history? There are still people today who don't even agree on the facts. There are Christians who refuse to disavow the dark past of Christianity using this text to enslave African Americans. These are proud oppressors. Proud oppressors, people who would rather wave and display a flag that represents more than just what side of the war you were on. A flag, artifacts, monuments, dead statues that commemorate and memorialize the suppression of people who were once viewed as three-fourths of a person in America. You all, these are proud oppressors. I serve a God that is so graceful that he will forgive anybody of anything. <laughs> How powerful is that? To God be praised. I serve a God who who can change the heart of kings. But not unless they confess their wrongdoing. It's one thing to have been an oppressor. It's another thing to be a proud oppressor. This text speaks of how an Assyrian king would believe more in his own way than in the way of what God's prophet was prescribing for God's people. How an Assyrian king would get caught up in his own thinking and stray from what the prophet of God had dictated. This text eventually resolves in the people's deliverance from the king. I just took you from verse 1 to verse 34 in a matter of seconds. Because it's not necessarily the history of this king that I want to uplift up, that I want to uplift, but rather it's the history of this practice that has persisted at the hands of the rich at the hands of the wealthy, at the hands of those who are powerful, at the demise of those who belong to God. The word of God says in verse two, those that have been turned aside, those who turn aside the needy from judgment and take away the right from the poor, of my people. If you view this text in any other translation, you might find this word. Those who turn aside the needy from justice. In the King James Version, when you see judgment, it is translated as being justice. But it's not really the justice language that, 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 that makes me want to praise my God. It's the ownership that we find in these two words, mid verse, my people. Uh, huh? To turn aside the needy from judgment and to take away the right from the poor of my people. Here we find even an Old Testament God. <laughs> 
He's the same today, yesterday, and forevermore. There are, are, are faiths that don't, even, that, don't even, that don't even place authority in the Old Testament text. I believe that even though we are under a new dispensation and under a new covenant, we can learn something about the nature of God yet and still. God displays and demonstrates ownership in this text of all people, especially the oppressed, especially, exceptionally, the poor, my people. In that day, it was the poor people and the widows. In that culture, the widower was considered to be amongst the most marginalized. In this culture, it's no longer the widower. So who do you think it is now? <laughs> Who do you think it is? I know you're going to say, well, you're going to say it's black people, preacher, because you're an African-American preacher fighting for justice and in the streets crying black lives matter. That's why you're going to say it's your people, huh? But let me tell you, that's not reason enough. That's not reason enough for it to be my people, for me to make this assumption that the widows of yesterday are the black folks of today. I'm going to tell you why I know. I'm going to qualify why it is. Because this woe was unto those who decree unrighteous decrees and who write grievousness laws against the poor. Answer me this question. Is it not black folks? who have been imposed upon by the letter of the law. Is it not our people, black and now Hispanic people, and a few Asians in between, who have not had the laws of the land be constructed and enacted against our black bodies? Our brother, Brother Kanai Adan, lifted up such a powerful point yesterday in our march, our I Am Change march in Graham, and I know that people may refer to this teaching for years to come. I just want you to know this is one day after history was recorded in Graham, North Carolina. Our brother Adan reminded us of how the words of Abraham Lincoln, which freed the slaves, were not necessarily spoken in terms and in the intent of justice and equality for all. Abraham Lincoln, who was credited with being a just president, said these words, if I could keep them enslaved and preserve the union, I would do so. <laughs> In other words, the only reason why this law has to change is so white supremacy, even in the North, could stay intact. We're saying black lives matter because black lives have had grievous and unrighteous decrees imposed upon us. But you took us from the beginning and the end of this chapter in just a matter of moments, preacher. So what do you mean that change is within our reach? I found comfort in these words. From verse 4, without me, God says, they shall bow down under the prisoners. Our oppressors will eventually be lower than the people they imprisoned. And they shall fall under the slain. Our oppressors, 
if they don't serve the God of all people, the God of no condemnation, the God of grace, but the God of justice. Our oppressors will eventually be in deeper graves than the graves that were dug from the black bodies that hung from the trees where they placed them. God says, for this anger is not turned away. For this anger, what does God mean? That this anger is not going to be turned away. God is saying to us that eventually our oppressors will have no place to flee. Amen. God is saying that eventually our oppressors, if they don't serve God, will eventually not be forgotten. God said these words. For all this anger is not turned away, but God's hand is stretched out still. That the hand of God is stretched out still. When I heard these words, I heard God say to me, tell my people who are fighting for justice everywhere. Change is within our reach. This God is guaranteeing unto us that I will reach out to you to pull you out from under the hand of those that have imprisoned you those that have written laws to keep you in an impoverished place. Those who have written laws against the most oppressed. Those who have followed the pattern of injustice. Those who have kept my people, my people, God said, in a place of oppression. My hand is stretched out. Uh, what does that mean for us? Where's the praise? Because in the tradition of the African-American church, we come to these religious spaces being so beaten, being so burdened. We arrive in our religious spaces and have every week throughout our history being saddened, sunken, sullen. Our, our nephews, our children, our fathers being hung. We've arrived in our religious spaces grieving the loss of life that will go on and there never being justice for those names that have been forgotten. We have arrived in our church every Sunday not looking for emotion as much as we were looking for celebration. We need to know that there is still hope in a God that we believe can bring change. And so preacher, where's the celebration in this? The celebration is that change is not so far off it is not so afar from us that is not within our reach. The celebration is in the fact that when God says that God is going to outstretch God's hand, that means that God is available to all of us who have been going through hell and running from hell hounds. When God stretches out God's hand, God has every intention for our hand to be within reach. When God says his hand is stretched out still, God is reminding us 
that I was there with those who were oppressed under a Pharaoh. I was there with them when they were confused about their own oppression. I was angry, but I would not leave them where I found them. I was angry when they said we were under better when we were under Pharaoh than the fact that God brought us out under Pharaoh's leadership but brought us to this wilderness to die. God said, I never intended for my people to die in wilderness and therefore I will deliver the next generation who will call out to my name and refuse false idols and graven images. God, I praise our God who is a God of the next generation. This is a God who speaks to us in these words. My hand is stretched out still. If I did it for Moses and the generation of those who refused to not give up, I'll do it for Martin's. I'll do it. I'll do it for Obama's. I'll do it for Jesse Jackson's folks. I'll do it for those who William Barber has been fighting for. I'll do it for those who have been marching with our meager, humble organization, Justice for the Next Generation. God is saying to us, I'm still willing to help you to bring about change. My hand is stretched out still. I want you to know change is within our reach. I want you to believe it. I want you to never give up on righteousness. The word of God teaches us. I would rather you do justice than to offer me sacrifices. Because it is, it, is, it is the intention, it is the intention of my God for change to come in every city, in every town, in every space where God's people, the beloved community, live. It is God's will for all God's people to have a chance at change. Especially those people who were born into poverty and still found themselves enslaved by poverty. The widows of yesterday are the hues of black and brown today. It is the will of our God that we would trust in God. And every time we step into those streets and every time we activate our voices and every time we lift up our hands and clench our fists and assume the pose of what power could look like if it could look like a body. It is because we are fighting for the rights of all people and the righteousness of God's purpose. To hear God say to me that my hand is still outstretched lets me know that our fighting is not in vain. It lets me know to the justice community all over the world that change, even though it seems so far away, it's closer than we believe. 
I believe change is close enough to be clinched. This is not about who you vote for. This is about those who will be voted in believing in who they serve. Because all these candidates are saying that they serve the God of the beloved community. Well, I want you to know that we are going to believe that as we exercise our rights, our rights to demand equality, our rights to believe God for a better day, our rights to lift up our voices and move our feet in the direction of forward, forward thinking, forward, forward communities, forward in our faith, forward in our togetherness, that we believe that, that soon and very soon we will have our hand in the hand of a God who has been waiting for us to reach back. I want to say to those of you all who still believe in God, reach back. I want to say to those who are watching my sermon, trying to find hate speech, who are combing through my words, my teachings and my preachings to identify some form of contempt. You have time to hear the truth and reach back because God's hand is stretched out still change is within our reach the word of God for the people of God and Lord we need your help We believe you when you say it. But now, God, we need to feel your touch. Our people are crying out for change. Our elders are tired of moving their feet. Our young people are disenchanted by a system of supremacy that was never intended to include them. And there are those in between who may not have been infected by COVID-19 but are being impacted by confusion to an eternity. Lord, we pray that you will strengthen us, that you will cover us as you did on yesterday, that you will keep us from dying at the hands of police, police brutality any further. Lord, we are asking you for that touch since your hand is stretched out. This is our prayer. And this is what I believe in Jesus' name. Amen. And to God be the glory for the things that God has done. If you're watching me today and you believe in what's going forth in our ministry and in our justice nation, please support our ministry in your giving to our disciples here in Citadel in your tithing. Please stay connected with us on social media. 
please plug in and send us your support and your prayers. Family, we will press our way on into Graham, North Carolina once again. I'm grateful to say that even though there was police brutality yesterday, upon our march, it did not result in any of our deaths. God has blessed us to live, to lift our voices, and to move our feet for another day. Finally, I want to say to the families of those who are concerned about us, to my family and yours, please understand that this work did not begin with us, but it is under a millennial movement that it has been advanced. Yesterday and for the past two days, I had the pleasure of spending more time with the George Floyd family. This is a family who has, who has at the hand of police brutality lost someone who deserved another chance. We have sat with, laughed, and cried with them. The George Floyd family was with us yesterday standing in solidarity. If a family who has lost their loved one can, can, call, can come all the way to North Carolina to stand with the Citadel Church and justice for the next generation, perhaps our families who have not lost us would not discourage us from this fight but push us to keep going. We need your support. We need your strength. We solicit your prayers because we firmly believe that God is on our side. If you're watching me today and you do not know God in the free pardon of your sins, I invite you to confess that. Because the word of God says that if you confess your sins, the Lord that I serve, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, is faithful and just to forgive you. If you pray this prayer, Lord, I have sinned, and I confess it right now. And in that same moment, I ask you, Lord, not just to forgive me, but to save me. Lord, will you come into my heart to be my savior, to be my master, to be my God and my guide. Jesus, I know this is possible because you, you died on the cross for my sins. And I confess you in my heart and I believe it in my mouth that you are Lord of all. I pray God's richest blessings upon you and God's grace, mercy, and peace in your houses and your homes. God bless you, Citadel, family and friends.